Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time. This week is not your mother's story time's fifth anniversary. Five years ago, on Halloween, was my first ever episode. Of course, I read Telltale Heart and the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. So for this episode, we're doing something different. We're breaking out of the public domain. I've got a new current author to share with you. His name is Lee Allen, an author in Wales, and he writes short stories, spooky short stories. I asked if he'd let me read one for my podcast anniversary, and he agreed. It's called A Deathly Shade of Pale. I think you'll enjoy it. You can find Lee Allen on Facebook and Instagram as Lee Allen Author. And now, A Deathly Shade of Pale. I am amongst the lost ones now, disjointed, fragmented, like I am only pieces of myself, an unknown quantity no longer wholly me, ground to dust and dispersed like slivers of shattered glass, carried as the breeze carries grains across dunes of sand, far and wide and without their own defined and fixed space, without their own identity. Is it possible that in those pieces are parts of me, now irretrievable, like an emotion no longer felt, A memory without recollection? A lesson unlearned? Has the whole of me, my body, my mind, my soul, become so unrecognizable that I am no longer myself, that whatever I feel that I am is simply not? And I am only a fragment, drifting in desolation and bewilderment like that single grain of sand, until it snuffs out like the dispelled smoke, as all other fragments have been or will soon follow. Consciousness thuds into my brain, hammering at my skull with relentless malice, daring the fog clouding my mind to clear, to burn my retinas with the truth of clarity. In this fog floats the remaining pieces of me, in a cloud of dislocation, The pain sears through my head, ringing down my ear canals, breath catching in my throat as if taken for the first time. Lightheadedness is like a hot, clammy hand clasping my brain, sucking me down into a vacuum. Vision blurred. I am aware only of the cold. My fingertips feel enclosed in icicles, breeze ruffling the hairs on my hands with a coating of moisture. I startle, rising quickly, and realize how stiff my body has become, collapsing back and hitting solid ground, yet feel it sway beneath me. A wave of disorientation, like the cloud has formed a fist with which to break me down. I raise my arms to protect my face from the blows, but they do not come. My breathing sounds shallow to my ears, alien and not from my own body part of the tapestry of the looming threat that does not manifest, but simply hovers, its shadow a constant and lingering specter. I drop my arms, hearing the splash as my fingertips collide with the iciness once more. Only now does clarity break a small dawn into my consciousness. I am beside water, my cold hand and arm the victim of its selfish kisses. I pull my hand away, reaching instinctively to wipe away the water on my coat. I stroke the fleece lining, its thick durability, understanding now why only parts of my body felt the chill, others insulated, fragmented awareness. My movements have triggered nerve endings to send the sluggish messages to my brain, the burning crick in my neck forcing its way through the laziness, demanding to be acknowledged. I am slouched into a corner, and my hand moves from my coat to what lies beneath it. It is solid, neither the soft sand nor rough earth I had expected. It is smooth, not the rugged formation of rock. My skin catches, pierced, blood-drawn. 
A splinter. I am on a wooden surface. I force my body upward to relieve the pain, the ground rocking, my hand gripping an edge beyond which is thickening fog. I am on a boat, a small wooden boat in a sea of mist. I listen to the silence, staring into the blackened water and the thick blanket of gray that hovers above it. I can see no more than a few feet beyond the edge. I watch the impenetrable blackness of the water and wonder at what is lurking just beneath the surface, that if my hand were to break the rippling calm, if it would be dragged from where I sit. In the dark, there is no indication of the water's depth or the dangers it obscures. By night, it is a great slumbering beast that when awakened will erupt with hisses and roars. But for now, its sound is silence. But for the lapping at the sides of the boat, the gentle breathing of sleep. I cannot remember how I came to be here, what led me to set off from the shore, nor even how far away that may be. I crane my sore neck, only to see more fog thickening in my vision. The black water beyond the stern of the wooden vessel. I climb to my feet carefully, slowly, the boat rocking with my movements. I grip the side as I stand, stooping, praying I will not be tipped over into the murky depths. As I steady myself, I pull my coat tight around me, squinting into the fog. There is nothing to see. I register movement to my left. From the little I see, it cannot be a large boat on which I find myself, suggesting the movement is at the bow. I hear dragging in the water, subtle under the constant lapping against the wood. Again, my eyes detect movement, a flash of ivory dim amongst the fog. Hello? My voice cracks in my throat, the words escaping in a hoarse whisper. I clear my throat soundlessly, now unsure whether I ought to call out again. Beneath the swell of the water, I hear the ripple of musical notes, incongruous in this cavern of mist and water. It is far away, a glimpse of the land I left behind, or a memory I can't quite reach out and hold. I cannot be sure which. No longer am I stood on the deck. I dance, swirling in circles, no longer in my heavy-lined coat, dressed in tails, my partner nestled in my arms, as elegant as she is beautiful. My hand reaches to touch her face, but she is gone, disintegrating into mist, her image now unclear in my mind. The boat rocks with my loss of concentration, my body unbalanced. I shift my feet to steady myself, aware again of movement at the bow. Hello? I call out again, bravery taking hold of me from I know not where. Where are we? There is no reply, nor do I expect one. Whomever is ferrying me across this expanse of water in the darkest hour of the night, they have no intention of making themselves known. Were I a braver man, perhaps I would tackle them in the darkness and row the boat myself to safety. But where is safety? Furthermore, am I not more likely to capsize the boat and send us both into the icy depths? I wouldn't bet against the chances of survival in these waters being short. That taking no consideration for what may be brought to the surface to investigate such a commotion as two fighting people and a damaged sinking rowboat. The wind picks up, blowing moisture into my face. Wiping my nose and forehead, I am surprised at the crinkling paper touch of my skin and squint at my hands as I hold them to my face. They are the hands of an old and weathered man. Could I have forgotten growing old? What happened to the intervening years between this moment and the young man dancing with his bride? Bride? The woman with the beautiful face whom I cannot quite remember. Could she really be my wife? I am no longer a young man, but I am sure I have never been a beautiful one. 
Am I simply an old and lost soul, dreaming of chances I never had? I do not remember my advancing years. But I cannot be sure that the woman I cannot see clearly, who fills my heart with a swelling I cannot fathom as I speculate on what I cannot recollect, is any more solid a memory than the years that are fluid and spectral as the mist I must surely be cutting through as we progress so slowly across this blackened expanse that I cannot be sure the boat is moving at all. Fatigue burns in my bones, and I squeeze my eyes shut. The wind and my faltering balance create a precarious rocking. I am already far too cold and weak to risk a plunge into the depths. Were my companion to help me to safety, I cannot be sure that the result would be a positive one. Perhaps sinking ever deeper into the blackness to meet the unknown would be a relief, a rescue from the unknown trials of the future. I gratefully sink to the stern once more, the hard edges harsh through my coat. I squeeze the pins and needles from my fingers with the fingers of my other hand alternately, hoping to squeeze blood back into them to fight out the chill. I listen to the distant stillness, the wash of the water as the wooden vessel cuts through it inch by inch, the insistent splash of the oar, my companion's heavy silence mere feet from me. Why did she leave me? The thought stabs through my pondering, accompanied by a lightness in my head and a heaviness in my chest that have me convinced I will expire here on the deck, relieving my companion of whatever need they have for me. Who left me? The woman with the simultaneously beautiful and featureless face? Was I not enough? Have I failed her? Did I not support her in times of strife and suffering, or celebrate her at times of peace and happiness? Have I broken my vows? I am convinced I have failed her deeply, that I must have done. I miss her dreadfully. For a fleeting moment there was a glimpse of clarity, but now it is gone again, drifting away on the mist, driftwood on the murky waters. I hear the persistent swish of the oar, determined, unrelenting, driven by the hand of someone who cannot be more than two yards away from me, obscured in the mist that prevents me from seeing more than a few feet ahead. Questions spin around my mind, unaided by memory. Captor or rescuer, I cannot know. I am tempted to call out, to ask who they are, but I'm struck dumb by my conviction that ignorance is favorable, that they wish to do me harm. How did I come to be here? If I could reach out to that fragment and pluck it from the wilderness of thoughts and emotions, I might be able to solve the mystery of my kidnapper's identity, so silent beyond the reach of my vision. The music I heard may have been from distant land, where I was attacked and subdued while I took a break from the dancing and celebrations. Yet that cannot be a recent memory, unless I have aged some fifty or sixty years during our journey." I grip my head with my fingers, desperate to squeeze some sense, some memory from the gray matter inside my skull. I have no strength in my fingers, the sensation weak and fruitless. I feel like screaming. What use am I to myself if I cannot form a coherent memory, cannot logically process what lies before me? My head is a fog, much like the green-gray mist thickening around me. Movement beside the boat captures my attention, a shape beneath the water, a darkening of the oily surface. I lean over, careful not to put too much weight to one side of the boat, yet my small movements have little impact while my body is prostrate. My strength has long since departed, the weight of a strong young man now degenerated to skin and bone and gristle, barely able to match the impact of a feather. To trouble this vessel, I must stand and move wildly, forget my balance as I cry out into the night. I watch the water. The shape is getting closer. What can be worse? A monster of the deep or the captor who remains silent in the dark? 
I draw back, the shape rising. It breaks the surface, water running in rivulets from its face. It is her. Unblemished alabaster skin. She floats on the surface, eyes and lips closed. I reach a trembling hand over the edge of the boat, mist tendrils of smoke around my skin. My thin fingers feel as if they could snap in the frigid air. If only I could touch her, perhaps I will remember. She sinks from my fingertips, swallowed by the inky waves. No! I lunge to grab hold of her. My hand cups only water, the boat rocking. Thunder growls in the distance. Who are you? I cry into the fury, unsure if I'm asking the question of the woman beneath the surface or whomever is at the helm of the boat. Yet neither answer. In spite of myself, I begin to weep, despair and isolation gripping my heart. Dry, soundless sobs tremble my weak, cold body. The thunder gives it its voice, a mighty roar that my lungs could no longer support. Somewhere beneath it, there is a whispering, as quiet but persistent as the dripping of a tap. Barely audible, but I detect it as a voice, as her voice. The hardest thing was leaving you. Lightning tears the fog to shards, allowing me a glimpse beyond its shroud. Water, seemingly for miles. Water, cloud, and emerald sky as one. Silhouetted against it, a figure in a hooded cloak, brandishing an oar. Before again, only the misty dark, with hues of green and gray. I watch the heavy veil, thunder rumbling. Rain pierces the fog, delivering powerful blows, slashing through the shroud that covers the water and the small boat. The raindrops are harsh and brutal, stinging my eyes and skin. I shield my face with my arm, trying to push myself to a sitting position with my other arm, finding I do not have the strength. Lightning sets the world ablaze once more, veiled in a ghostly green, a concoction of the storm's blue light against the red of a setting sun. Has the sun not long since set? How could I know, lost in this fog? The deck is fully visible in these few seconds. The hooded figure is turning to face me, its face obscured, before I return to the dark. The rain is freezing to hail, cutting at my hands and face. I feel my cheek tear, blood joining the ice-cold water running down my face and neck. The boat moves rapidly, rocked back and forth by the might of the ocean, water spilling over the edges from the waves. The excited current pulls the boat in different directions, spinning clockwise, then anti-clockwise. I cling to the edge, unable to distinguish between the roars of the waves, the thunder, and the hail. Lightning illuminates the deck on which I lie, helpless, hopeless, simultaneous with a booming eruption that must be the thunder beyond the crazed fury of the water. The cloaked figure steps closer. I can neither move nor make a sound as vision vanishes. How can this creature maintain its balance? The boat spins, tipping, water pooling at my back, my feet submerged. I am sure that my captor will finally be lost, pulled from the deck into the swirling currents below. The sky tears open once again. The figure looms over me, a hand outstretched towards me. Finally, I scream, the boat lurching as I feel bony fingers close around my face. I struggle, just as a wave hits the edge of the boat, tipping me to the left. I hold on to the edge tightly, convinced we are about to capsize. But the tiny vessel lurches back, counterbalancing against the force, tipping to the right. My hold is dislodged. I pour into the water, immediately submerged, flailing arms and legs. My mouth opens and I taste salt and sand, sputtering and gulping more. My chest burns. I feel my body sinking, the weight of the water above me, pushing me deeper. Shapes move beneath me, hungry, awaiting their prey. Slave to the water, I am dragged around like a child's lost toy. 
I break the surface, clawing breath into my ragged throat. All I feel are needles cutting and tearing my body from the inside out. I see nothing, not the boat, not even the sky above me. Another wave rises over my head. My arms are weakening, barely able to move. Final pockets of air escape my screaming mouth. My bones are lead, sinking through the water, away from where the current commands and goes to war with the raging air. She is here, sinking with me. I have barely the strength in my fingers as she reaches for my hand, her face floating mere inches from my own. A single bubble escapes her lips, and she giggles, girlish. But I cannot hear anything but water. Her hair rises above her head, drifting around her. Weight pulls on my feet, and I wonder how far there is to sink. Perhaps the sinking is endless. She speaks, but I cannot hear her. I reach for her other hand, but cannot find it. She blinks sadly, as if she is crying. But I cannot see her tears beneath the water. I close my eyes trying to squeeze out the sting so that I can see clearly the words which she speaks. It was never my intention to cause you so much pain. Something hits me from behind, a crushing blow to my spine that catapults me forward, spinning over her head. The current takes a grip on me again, a whirlpool somersaulting my body, vision lost in a rush of water and sand, salt stinging my lips and eyes. Punched and kicked, I am sure that my bones will snap, that my useless, weak body can endure no more. Finally, I crush against solid ground, exhausted, drained of all I have left. Have I reached the seabed? Or have I found my place between a rock crevice, trapped there for the water to assault me anew? The thunder begins to dissipate. Fluid drains from my ears. The storm has passed, the ocean calming. Is this the sound of death? Fog has filled my head, obscuring the last shards of my splintered mind. My body feels heavy. I try to move and cannot. I no longer know my own body. Estranged. It has betrayed me along with my mind. There was a time I felt in control of both. They were part of me an extension of me, synchronized. Now I cannot trust what either do, for they do not bend to my will. The ground beneath me is cold and damp. It feels like grit in my slashed cheek, stinging with salt. I am unable to move my fingers, clumps of sludge forming beneath my hands. My limbs rest at unnatural angles. The water is behind me, I bend my elbow, bend my wrist, prop a palm flat on the ground. It sinks as I push against it. I bend a knee, feel a rock sharp against my kneecap. I bend another knee and stagger back, still pushing with my hand, splashing back into the water as I look around and above me. I find myself on a beach, dark, derelict. I may have been here for hours on the sand, I cannot know. The sea spat me out. I look behind me, the shimmering blackness, fog hanging low over the water. I cannot see a boat, no battered carcass of one floating to shore. I look along the beach. The mist does not hang so heavily over the land. The gray sand runs smoothly in both directions, black hulls of trees looming beyond it. Rocks frame the sand on either side, no more than shapes that could easily be cloaked and hooded figures awaiting my next move. I get to my feet, legs stiff and crooked, staggering forward, only just saving myself from falling to the sand. I am unsure if I could get back up again. I have so little energy. It is damp and cold, biting wind riding in from the sea. I turn towards it, then the trees, then into the distance to the rocks. 
unable to shake off my bewilderment. Far from the dancing and the laughter and the youthful woman, they are all dimmed now, like an old photograph in sepia you cannot remember being taken. My shoulders sag. I do not truly have options when I cannot know where any of them may lead me. So I simply choose to turn right and begin to trudge in that direction, following the line of the sea, sand sloping beneath my feet. Slow already, I am slowing more. I move up the sand a little, away from the water, which is again beginning to grow agitated. The rocks loom larger with my painful progress. I still see the fleshless hand reaching for me from beneath the cloak. I should stop, to take the weight off my sore feet, to calm the tightness in my chest. I cough and gag, still tasting salt water. Head down, stumbling, I know I must soon stop before I collapse here and rot from exposure, unless the sea reaches out to take me back beforehand. I need heat. I need shelter. I look to the trees, ominous strangers, knowing they are my final hope. I look around the sand at my feet, searching for pebbles. The beach is strewn with them, cast up the shore by the cantankerous tides. I stoop to investigate them closely, hearing my knees and back crack in protest. I find a sharp-edged stone, suitable for stripping and sanding wood. With my pebble clasped in my palm, I look to the trees with some trepidation. Behind any of the gnarled trunks that merge with ease into the shadows could lurk my hooded companion from the boat. But he could not have survived. Yet, somehow you did. I turn to look back to the shore. It is her voice, I am sure of it. But I can see no one nor hear anything more, only the swell of the waves, now the gentle snoring of a slumbering beast. I search for tinder amongst the shrubbery and the low-hanging branches, thankful that the tide does not appear to reach this far, as the ground is dry. I scrape the brittle moss from the trunks of trees with the pebble, chipping off the dead bark, gathering it with fallen leaves and small twigs that have gathered on the ground. My coat is sodden unsuitable for keeping my bundle dry, so I feel around in the earth, having to abandon my tinder. I stumble and trip, each time feeling a new pain or twinge in my body. I do not know it still. It has forsaken me, no longer working in harmony with my mind. Rummaging in the undergrowth for some time, I find a large flat rock, its top smooth as slate, scraping dry earth from it victoriously. It takes a great will of strength to lift it, fatigue deep to the bone in my arms. With the rock in both my hands, I return to the base of the tree I began with, gathering up my tinder and collecting it atop my find. I feel above my head for snags and test the ends of branches. These trees are dead. I estimate the season as late autumn or winter, accounting from how cold I am in this wilderness. I wonder how I spent the last summer, indeed all my summers, dreaming at the notion of a summer evening dancing. Did I make her laugh? Did her heart sing and her stomach flutter in my presence? I scold myself. I am an old man thinking a young man's thoughts. But when do we realize we have grown old? is the day our bodies begin to let us down. I wish I could remember when I first felt it. Aging is not an abrupt new phase, but a gradual realization. Perhaps it took me years to wake one morning with the acceptance that I was no longer young, that despite my mind feeling and thinking the same, my body has slowly committed its act of treachery, unwilling to fight nature in the way my mind is capable. My kindling gathered on the ground beside my rock of tinder. I search for larger dead branches. Carrying branches under my arms, I return to the beach, choosing a spot only a few feet from the trees, hoping for adequate shelter from the wind. 
I place my palm flat on the sand, checking that it is dry. I return to the trees for the tinder and kindling. I squint into the distance. But only blackness sways there. Sitting on the sand, I claw out a small pit in front of me, hoping this will defeat the breeze. I choose the three largest branches and prop them around the hole, pushing them into the sand for foundation, all three meeting at the top, wedged together. Smaller branches prop against and inside the cone. From the rock, I take the mix of bark and leaves, molding them together with my fingers into a small ball with an indent in its center. I lace the stems of leaves to hold them together, combating the lifeless fragility. The remainder of the tinder I scoop into the hole beneath the cone. I pause, looking out to sea. Where did I come from? Where am I going? Perhaps the most crucial question, will that be different to the destination my captor intended? Or am I on an inevitable course? I begin work on the two branches I have kept aside, concentration distracting and focusing my disjointed mind. With a sharp pebble, I gouge a hole out of the flatter branch, having to lean over it to put my weight behind it. The sand proves to be a difficult surface, so I balance it on the rock. Next, I work on the cylindrical branch, stripping away the wood with the edge of the pebble, carving the end into a blunted spike. Inserting the spike into the hole, I twist the branch back and forth, forcing through the ache in my arms and the burning pain in my knees. I smell the smoke, though I cannot see it, and taking up the pebble again, I chip into the side of the branch from the edge to meet the burnt hole. Time stretches as I work away, listening to the quiet beyond. Finally, I feel the loss of resistance as the edge of the pebble reaches the hole. I collapse to the sand, gathering leaves and putting them on top of the rock, balancing the wood over the top of it. Inserting the branch again, I twist and turn it, back and forth, anxious not to let it slip. I know not how long I am here, listening to the friction of the wood. Eventually, I see the faint glow. Victorious, I pull the branch away, fanning air over the coal nestled in the leaves. Gently, I scoop it into the ball of tinder, blowing as I squeeze it. The ember continues to glow, spreading throughout the tinder. As flame begins to trickle through, I drop it into the pit beneath the cone on top of the dry leaves and bark. The flame catches them easily. I add more tinder, slowly watching the fire grow, before I add my collection of kindling, piece by piece. The fire grasps it greedily, embers sparking before fire engulfs it, spreading wider. I gaze into the bright light as it finally conquers the cone, so dazzling after so much time in semi to full darkness, I feel the heat. I stretch out my fingers, the glow of dancing flame catching the dull pallor of my skin. It is so papery. I fear if I were to get too close, I too would catch a light. I pull at my damp coat, dragging it from my shoulders, hoping without it the heat can reach my body, to breathe a little life into my tired bones. I lay on the sand before the fire, sitting back, my eyes drawn into the flames. I close my eyes against the searing light, orange glowing behind my eyelids. Once more I can hear music. It sounds closer this time than before, when I was on the boat. Opening my eyes, I see her face through the flames. Who is she to me? That her face permeates my every thought, invades my vision like a spectral vapor, has the moisture stinging in my eyes as I bear witness to her countenance. I feel she was once very important to me, and though my memory does not serve me, I feel the ache of the empty hole left in the space she once occupied in my heart. To whom do I owe the drying salt on my cheeks that came not from the sea that froths beyond the flames, that battered the timber in which I made my bed, and from which I fell into the depths?
I am so sorry for all the pain. You were always my beam of light atop the cliffs, on my most treacherous journey. I let myself weep, instinctively searching pockets for a handkerchief, outside pockets on my suit jacket, an inside pocket. We were each other's light. I'm sorry my light went out for you. I pull sheets of paper from my left pocket, sodden from my time in the ocean, the lining of my jacket and my coat powerless to protect them. Envelopes, stuck together so I have to peel them apart. The seals come apart as easily as cotton wool. Folded sheets inside have been glued together by the water. The ink is obscured, in parts washed away, in others run together between the creases in the paper. Only a minor few words remain, not enough to form sentences. I squint to decipher something from it by firelight. Is it addressed to Dad? Am I a father? A grandfather, even? Could that lend a clue as to how I came to be here? My hand closes around something solid in my right pocket. I withdraw it, opening my fingers as I look at the small object lying in my palm. An ornament, like those found in a trinket shop in a coastal village. It is a lighthouse, white and red, stood atop a black rock adorned with a white skull and crossbones. The stinging in my eyes registers before the memory that sweeps in like a tidal wave. The heaviness in my chest grows, an expanding void in my heart that will swallow me up. I feel her so close, yet she has never been further away. I look around at the trees, the sand around my feet, and my makeshift fire, to the dark swell of the sea beyond and the dark sky obscured by fog. I ache to feel her arms around me, to know she is there, and I am not alone in a hopeless world. But there is no comfort, not the presence and support of another human being, nor the warmth of a body to ease the chill in my heart. Instead, it is I holding her, her body cold and weak, drained of the blood that colors the water that has gone cold around her, pink rivulets running from her fingers, dripping to the floor as I pull her to me, crying out for her to answer. But her pale face does not form expression. Her lips do not form words, nor even the smallest smile of reassurance. The ugly wounds on her arms form the only message. It was a long time afterwards before I could bring myself to read the note she had written for me. A long time after they had all told me there was no villain to blame, no crime to answer. I could not accept that she acted alone, that this was her choice. I was so terrified of not being able to love you enough. How can I love you how you deserved when I cannot even love myself? I could not understand how she truly believed I was better off without her. She was my world. I worshipped her. Beside the fire, I let my tears fall, sobs racking my entire body. The years went by, each one marled with sorrow, grief still captive over my soul. I see that day again now, so long ago, when we danced and laughed and made our vows. Yet death could not part us in my heart. Without her, I am a sinking ship, wounded by the treacherous rocks that snared me, without her light to guide me. When someone dies, it feels as if your life has stopped too. We expect the world around us to stop, but it keeps on turning, going on as if nothing significant has happened. How dare it, behaving as if it hadn't shattered today? It is so unfair, so criminal, its indifference. I wanted to tear it down, to make it all stop, to make everyone see. We lost someone today, someone good, someone loved, someone worth crushing the world for, if even for a moment. That would be only just. How can it all go on without her in it? 
I feel so cruel being alive when she was not. Time goes by, each new day feeling like a betrayal. There is movement beyond the fire. Is it her? Is this why I am here? How long did I search for a way to find her? Have I finally succeeded? I am on my feet, moving swiftly around the fire, marching with renewed vigor toward the dark, hulking mass that bookends the beach. Water seeps into my shoes, the tide coming in, but I keep on striding. Reaching the first rocks, I step over them, my leg plunging into a rock pool left earlier in the day by the retreating tide. I sink into the water to my waist, scrambling for a hold on the rocks at the other side, heaving myself out, surprised at the strength in my fatigued body. But I cannot take the time to dwell on it, reaching up with a wet hand for a slippery hold above me, feet scraping and sliding for stability, clinging to the rough edges, grateful for them as the smooth surfaces are too treacherous. I pull upwards, clamoring higher. I reach the peak, curling over it, energy spent. Beyond it, the rocks descend to more sand. Wearily, I begin to climb down, finding this equally strenuous. I lose my footing, plunging forward, my body powerless against the sharp edges and slippery surfaces. I hit the sand, expecting the cracking of breaking bones to follow. But they make no sound. Lying here, I listen to the waves. I should have stayed by the fire. Its safety and warmth. The hours I spent building it. Yet I have abandoned it in pursuit of what? A woman who abandoned me? Is that the question I want answered? Why? Or do I want absolution for my guilt? The guilt of being left behind. The guilt of continuing to live. The sand muffles my sobbing, the sea blanketing them, both conspiring to hide my shame. Exhausted, I drag myself forward, forward again onto my knees. Wiping the sand and tears from my face, I look ahead of me, a deeper chill dragging on me than temperature alone. Moored at the edge of the incoming tide is a rowboat. Jostled by the waves, the slight and indecisive movement punctuates its abandonment. My captor is here, with me on this island. For I am sure now that they were my captor, that I had no choice in my journeying with them. They and the boat survived the storm, following me to shore, mooring in the next cove. They have watched me, building my fire, remembering my wife. If they did not mean me ill, why not reveal themselves to me? They have watched me struggle, and watched me still. I remember the hand reaching for me on the boat. I look up and meet their eyes, where they stand further along the shoreline in the shadow of the cliff, barely visible as the moon pierces the fog with the light it doesn't own. The wind off the sea ruffles their cloak. Their eyes are hollow, devoid of life, skin pulled back so tight I can see the white of their skull through it, black eyes like deep sockets. They are grinning, for I can see their teeth, a wickedness to their smile. What do they want with me? As if in response, their hand reaches out to me once again, a bony claw. I realize they are pointing, not at me, but beyond me. I dare not drop my gaze from theirs, but they continue to point. I tear my eyes away, risking no more than two seconds only to see nothing. I expect to turn and find them upon me, their quest and cruel intentions for me within their grasp, a bony claw reaching around my throat. But they are gone. The wind coming off the sea to circle an empty beach as it pulls cloud and fog to obscure the moon. I look around, from the corners of the cove, across the sweeping sand, down to the sea. I cannot see where they may have gone, unless they lurk in a shadow cast by the cliff or in a crevice hidden in the rock. I have only one clue. I turn in search of it, seeing nothing in my wild haste, running my hands over the rocks in case my eyes are failing me. I put pressure on them, my frustration building. 
I fear I am simply falling into their trap, that evil grin looming at me out of the darkness. Suddenly, I am pushing at nothing. I stumble into a void. I feel around in front of me, waving my arms ahead. It is the entrance to a cave. My nostrils flare at its dankness, the stench of seaweed and salt. Hearing the ocean behind me, it is a reminder that this cave will soon fill with water as the tide makes its way up the beach. Am I such a fool to allow myself to be so easily led into a trap? If it leads nowhere, the cave may become my subaqueous grave. Yet I strive on, albeit with caution. Soon, I deduce that light must have found a path to filter its way in. Much like in the mist and amongst the trees, I find myself able to see, though dimly, and hardly more than a few feet before me. Perhaps my vision has grown accustomed to the solid blackness of the cave, for it is deep night outside, and the moon mostly obscured. I can still hear the sea, its waves echoing, having reached the mouth of the cave. I am heading upwards, the climb growing steeper, though not as slippery as my earlier climb. I hope I have passed the point to which the water will fully climb. I hear it rushing in behind me, followed by a crashing roar of suction as it retreats. I shudder. If I am wrong, I will be trapped here to drown. I force myself on, impelled to escape the fury of the beast at my ankles. It has grown relentless. I wish she was here to comfort me. A fleeting thought. But since I've remembered who she is, put an identity to her face, she has abandoned me once again. My face hits solid rock, agony splitting into my head. My hands move around me, my eyes squint to see, but they have lost vision. I am surrounded on all sides. I hit out, but I have ascended into a natural alcove, the end of a channel in the cliff. I could be at its center, so far from the warmth of my fire now, ready to meet oblivion. Follow me. I hear her voice and know that I have always heard her voice. It calls to me always. In the night when I lie alone, I would close my eyes and hear her calling. I would call back. But when I turn, she would not be there. I would wake with the tears still wet in my eyes from a dream of her. Memories, dreams, fantasies, they all feel the same. In all of them, she is here with me. In life, she is not. I screw my hands into fists, punching the walls of the rock, my brittle skin tearing, blood streaming between my knuckles. I hit out above me, beneath me, the cliff squeezing me. I care not if I lose my footing and slip into the watery cavern of the cliff below me. I am at journey's end. My strength is almost vanquished. My final strike is upwards, and I am prepared for the rebounding fall backwards. I can fight no longer. But I propel forward. The rock above my head is not solid and finally succumbs to force. Light breaks through. With it, wind and moisture. The ocean is roaring, fully awake and alert. With bleeding fingers, I pull my spent body up towards the glimmer of light. My shoulders meeting rock. I push my arm through and feel around the opening. More rock downwards, earth and grass upwards. I have reached the summit. Up farther than where I sat earlier. I am confident the ocean cannot reach me here. My shoulders keep pushing. Pebbles and moss give way above me. The rock shifts as my back presses against it. Something touches my hand as it lies on the grass surface. Perhaps an animal investigating such a strange occurrence. But this something has fingers resting over mine. They feel cold, like hers when I held her hand when I found her. You are a good man. I didn't believe I could ever be worthy of you, that I could ever love you as much as you deserved. It is a deep, animal growl that escapes me, 
ascending to a scream as I force my body into the gap. A boulder breaks free, falling away from me, and I roar at the sky as I teeter on the edge of the cliff, rising from the crevice below, a cry of raw agony and loss and grief. I see my fire far below, just before it extinguishes as the ocean rushes to claim it. I see the rapidly vanishing beach and the trees and the rocks, the mighty ocean as it splits and rages at them all. I reach upwards, digging my fingers into the grass, pulling myself forward inch by inch, using my elbows as leverage as I emerge from the ground and crawl from the cliff's edge. I close my eyes and feel the ground against my cheek. It is a long time before I am able to lift my head and look around. Beyond the ground on which I lie is the ocean and the sky. Is that a bird singing? Perhaps it is her singing. I turn over, my back against the ground. Towering above me is a lighthouse, reaching up toward the sky, high above, and the moon that hangs there like a vast tapestry. Her lighthouse. Our lighthouse. I am slow, but I succeed in getting to my feet, staggering, stumbling. Behind the lighthouse, the dawn is coming, a dazzling trickling of light, blooming across the hemisphere. At the foot of the lighthouse is an archway. I narrow my eyes against the light. She is there. She sees me. A radiant smile fills her face, and I cry out as I witness it. I run to her, opening my arms as the joy sweeps into me. She cries out too, full of emotion as I get close. I reach out to touch her face, to wipe the tears from her eyes as I always did, for I have found her again. But I find the archway barred. No! I grip the bars with my bleeding hands. She touches them, crying silently. You need to let go. I stare at her, horrified she can ask that of me, my eyes pleading with her. I've searched for you for so long. I felt so abandoned when you left, so worthless. I am choking. Please, you must let go. No, I cannot. I spent so many years aching for you. I promised to find you. I've kept my promise. She shakes her head, closing her fingers over mine the way she was unable to the last time I held her hand. You were trapped by grief. Let yourself become imprisoned because of the pain caused by my actions. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. If only you can believe me. Please, for me, let it imprison you no longer. You can be free. Her eyes are burdened with sorrow. My heart breaks all over again. I feel my face cracking. No longer can I form words. I grew old, still searching for her every day. She turns from me, tears pouring down her beautiful face, the face that has haunted me for most of my life. Those eyes, so heavy, so tired, are bursting with the agony that I carried with me to this place. I rattle the bars, but they hold as she walks away. I watch her back, sinking to my knees. I cry out to the rising sun as the sky bleeds crimson, the moon melting like wax, dripping to the ocean, a sea of blood stretching out without end. I can beg no more to hold her one final time. Rising, I stagger toward the ocean, closing my eyes and hearing the waves far beneath me. The smell of the tide reaching up, beckoning to me, the cold breeze reaching to give me a helping hand. I stumble, my feet unsteady. I wonder if this is it. The moment. I fall. Earth is beneath me instead of water. I open my eyes. I did not reach the edge, having instead fallen on a mound of earth. I look around me. Freshly dug earth, a hole refilled. 
urgently. I dig my hands to it, flinging earth behind me. I keep going, pushing it to the sides as I dig deeper. I know I will find her here, that I can hold her again. As the sun rises, I sink deeper. When my fingers unearth material, I become more frantic, scraping the earth away from it. I recoil as I wipe away the last of the earth. A skull grins up at me. The same grin I witnessed on the beach in the darkness. The same pale visage that watched me through the mist as I lay at the stern of the boat. My captor, my tormentor, a long-buried corpse. I feel the black material of the hood around their head. I clear more earth from them. Beneath the cloak, they wear a suit. I look at my arms as they clear more earth. Look at my jacket. I feel under my collar to my shirt beneath it, slit down my back. I clear more earth. See their hands resting in their lap. From their bony fingers, I pry a small object. A lighthouse, white and red atop a black rock, adorned with a white skull and crossbones. Please, you must let go. She was imploring me to let go of life, of all the pain and misery, the grief and despair. You need to let go. I rise slowly, the lighthouse still gripped in my hand. But how do I let go? How do I stop all that noise in my head that is barring me from peace? How do I escape my prison? I pull myself from my own grave, grazing up to the bleeding sky. I pocket the lighthouse. Numb, I walk back to the lighthouse and around it. There is a winding path down to the cove, only visible by daylight. I set my foot on the gravel, each step sending a spasm through my body. Reaching the sand, I want to crumble, to succumb. But I cannot let myself. I spent an entire life fighting. I do not know how to give in now. Devious fragments conspire to feign bodily function, conning others into believing they function as they always have done, together hiding the truth from those remaining, as we travel in this place that twists the laws of nature to its will. The truth of clarity, yet never the clarity of truth. The boat is still moored where I found it last night. The ocean spared it from its biblical rage. I push it out onto the water, climbing in, untying the rope attached to its anchor, letting it drop to the water, floating away. The long single oar is wedged beneath a wooden beam. I pull it free and submerge the end, hitting the sand beneath the waves, pushing off. The sea is calm. After some time, I set down my oar, fatigue dragging on me. I can go no further. I move to the stern, wanting only sleep. I sink to the solid timber, feeling it rough against my bones. Beneath the seat is an old coat which I shrug around my shoulders. I look up to the sky. It no longer bleeds. The sun is directly over me, making my eyes water. It is warm, comforting. Maybe this is when my quest will end. After all this searching, I have finally found her. My eyes close against the dazzling brightness. I am amongst the lost ones now, disjointed, fragmented, like I am only pieces of myself, an unknown quantity no longer wholly me, ground to dust and dispersed like slivers of shattered glass, carried as the breeze carries grains across dunes of sand, far and wide and without their own defined and fixed space, without their own identity. Is it possible that in those pieces are parts of me now irretrievable, like an emotion no longer felt, a memory without recollection, a lesson unlearned, has the whole of me, my body, my mind, my soul, become so unrecognizable that I am no longer myself, that whatever I feel that I am is simply not? And I am only a fragment, 
drifting in desolation and bewilderment like that single grain of sand until it snuffs out like the dispelled smoke as all other fragments have been or will soon fall. And that's our story for this evening. I hope you enjoyed A Deathly Shade of Pale by Lee Allen. Thank you for listening. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time.